would please take and turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 15. So I've never been in the back of the room or the back of the building during the church service. I felt like I was like one of those like celebrity preachers that like a green room and they just sit back there by themselves and then they just come walking on the stage. Yeah, that's not really my thing, but, uh, but sort of a weird, weird experience for me. <clears throat> Now, as we move through the Gospel of Mark, we've already looked at verses 53 through 65. And what we saw that was in the middle of the night, there was this sham trial in which Jesus was taken before the Sanhedrin, at least a quorum of the Sanhedrin, in Caiaphas' home, and he was tried for ultimately blasphemy. And the reason he was accused of blasphemy is because of the misinterpretation of the religious leaders. They were anticipating that the Messiah would come in this sort of glorious, rebel sort of power and overthrow the Roman Empire and exalt Israel back to its prominence. But this is not what Jesus does in his first advent. And so after they took him and beat him and mocked him, remember they would punch him in the face and then ask, who was it that punched you? Again, but misunderstanding their interpretation of the scriptures. It's now time in order for them to turn Jesus over to Pilate, who is the Roman prefect or the governor, according to the Roman law. Now, throughout this, we throughout this study of the Passion, what I want to ensure that we are, are not missing is we are not seeing a weak Christ. We are not seeing Jesus as being incapable of defending himself. Instead, what we see is one who has submitted himself perfectly to the will of the Father, which has already been prophesied beforehand. In chapter 10, verses 33 to 34, Jesus says this, he says, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. This is what Jesus knew was his destiny, and he is sovereignly bringing that about. Now, this is especially important for the recipients of this letter. Remember, we believe that Mark is writing this after Peter's death, and he is writing this to the church in Rome, which is in the midst of persecution, and only more intense persecution would come in the, uh, the decades in the future. Jesus says this to his disciples, but here, collectively, Mark writes this to the recipients in Rome, and by the Spirit, writes it to us. And he says in chapter 13, verse 9 through 13, But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must, be, must first be proclaimed in all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And so here, in this, we see Jesus as our great example. Our ability to stand in the midst of persecution comes through the example and the power provided in Christ. Notice here what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 13 through 14. Paul writes this, and I'm going to sort of abbreviate it here. It says, he says, I charge you, and then he and then there was some extra stuff here. And he says, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here the commandment is to obey the commands of Christ, to keep the gospel, right? And he says, I charge you to do this. And then he says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things, right? So God is the one who witnesses us. He is the witness who stands against us or stands for us, right? We do it in his presence, but we also do it in the presence of Jesus Christ, 
And notice what Paul identifies. How do we know Jesus is a worthy witness? How do we know that his example is fitting? It says, I charge you in the presence of Jesus Christ, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. And so in this text, we have here the encouragement and the example of Jesus of how we are to stand firm in the faith. And that's what we'll see this morning in chapter 15, verses 1 through 15. So if you're able, please stand, and we will read together this text. This is God's word. Let us hear and obey with God's grace. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priest accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner from whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison, one had committed murder in the insurrection. There was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man who, man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. But Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. This is God's word. You may be seated. Let us pray. Father, Lord, we ask your blessing on us as we come to this text, another mournful and difficult and challenging text, given the sorrow of what happens to our Christ the King. But in it, Lord, may you give us grace that our faith might be built up as we see as we see in Jesus the example of what it is to surrender to your will, to do that which you have called him to, and the strength in which he did it. And so, Father, we pray that by your word and by your spirit, that strength would be given to us, and that we would be empowered to be your servants. We pray this in the, for the glory of our Christ. In his great name we pray. Amen. Now, the Roman government had a, a rule that, that in, it, in which it allowed its subjected territories, like Judea at this time, to largely legislate and administer their own justice. Now this would be different than what we would think of like the British colonies. When Britain would come in and take over an area, the king and parliament exercised authority on the colonies in a distant place. Rome largely allowed governments to kind of continue to do what they were doing, but there was a prefect or a governor or some sort of legislative ruler over them, uh, but they were still underneath that large allowed to do what they could do. But the one thing that Rome usually reserved the right for was capital punishment. As the, uh, as the supreme authority and ruler in the empire, they alone had the jurisdiction to exercise the death penalty. So here, the Sanhedrin, it tells us in verse 1, turns Jesus over early in the morning because the trial that he had faced before them had transpired throughout the entire night. Now here, Pilate could either um, deny or confirm the accusations of the Sanhedrin. It was his responsibility to personally investigate the matter, and this is likely why we see that in verse 1 there's this consultation between the priest and the elders they're coming together to see what charges will we bring to Pilate against Jesus. Because blasphemy is not a concern for Rome. The Sanhedrin had accused Jesus of a religious crime. 
that Jesus had not committed a crime against Rome. He had committed a crime against the Jews either, um, but they had, that's what they had um, accused him of. And so their accusation against Jesus is that they are accusing him of high treason. He is claiming to be king, and therefore he is setting himself at odds with the Roman Empire. Now this would have likely been a, a public trial in which you would have had a, a few accusers come up and accuse the, the, the defendant of what he did wrong, and then they would give the evidence for that. And then the expectation is that the accused would then give rebuttal evidence. And so that's likely what takes place here is that they bring him to Pilate, and then they make these accusations against him. So here, um, the designation of the Messiah is essentially religious. To be the Messiah is to be the fulfillment of the Davidic line, right? Uh, but there's this idea of this eschatological salvation, right? This is mostly a religious context. And so, because that has no importance to Rome, we see that Jesus is given a different title. So that's why when in verse 2, when Pilate asks him, he doesn't say, are you the Messiah, right? Are you this salvation sort of figure? He says, are you the king of the Jews? And by asking this question, what he's really asking is, are you the leader of the resistance? Are you the leader of those who are trying to overthrow Roman authority in, in Judea? Now, Jesus here answers in a surprising way. He's asked, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, you have said so. Right? So this is basically a sort of a roundabout way of saying, yes, I am the king of the Jews. But the implication here is that Jesus is suggesting that even though he is the king of the Jews, the ramifications of his kingship is going to be very different than what Pilate would have been thinking he meant. By his messiahship, he, Jesus is the king, but in his first advent, his kingship is not associated with a change in secular power. He was not coming to overthrow Rome or any other nation. So now in verses 3 through 5, we see that the chief priests had opportunity to make more accusations. The other gospels fill this in a little bit more. For example, in Luke 23, 5, we're told that one of the accusations used against Jesus is that he was telling individuals not to pay taxes. When in fact, we already saw that the question about this, Jesus said to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Another accusation in Luke 23, verse 5, well, that, was 20, that was verse 2, this is verse 5, it is that Jesus was trying to stir up strife and conflict in the whole region. Well, remember that most of Jesus' ministry did not take place in Judea, but took place in Galilee. And so the idea is that not only in, in Pilate's jurisdiction, but also in Herod's jurisdiction, Jesus is here causing, um, causing uh, the people to get riled up for the purpose of rebelling against, uh, against Rome. But here, what we see is that Jesus fulfills the prophecy given in Isaiah of the suffering servant. In Isaiah 53, 7, it says this. It says, he was opposed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So here, Jesus makes no defense. He gives no rebuttal. And Jesus is the perfectly innocent one. He could have defended himself in all of these charges. And yet what we see in his, in his sovereign submission to the Father, he remained silent that the Father's purposes could come to an end. The result is, is by not defending himself, very different from our judicial system. We have the right to plead the fifth. We don't have to defend ourselves. In Roman rule, in Roman law, the refusal to defend oneself implied that the accusations were worthy. And thus, by not defending himself, he is found guilty. Now, John provides additional information and it shows that eventually Judas does not believe that Jesus is any sort of political threat. Jesus has no, no threat, his, as a no threat, his kingship, his messianic position is no threat to Rome. And so Peter and so Pilate knows this. But here, Mark's intent is different from John's. 
Mark's intent is to show that Jesus' silence is a demonstration of his submission to the Father. Jesus is doing this because if he defended himself, he would not have been taken to the cross. Jesus' silence is a part of his securing God's redemptive purposes. And what we see is this silence leaves Pilate absolutely amazed. Now in verses 6 through 15, we see sort of Pilate as this spineless character, as this individual who acts in fear. Now condemned for refusing to defend himself, right? The Jesus is now guilty, but there was this opportunity for Jesus' release. So Pilate had a custom, in a sense, in order to appease the people, to sort of get the people on his side, is that during every Passover, he would allow one convicted criminal amnesty. He would free that individual, pardon that individual. Now you have to remember that during this feast, the size of the city, the population of the city swells significantly as individuals from all over the regions surrounding Judea come in, as these Jews come in for this holy festival. Also remember that Passover was the time when God delivered his people from Egypt. And so every time they come in for this Passover meal, there is this anxi- anxiousness and this anticipation of God bringing about deliverance again. And you would have had the zealots who would have been constantly at work trying to stir up the people, saying, this is the time for us to rebel. This is the time for us to have a new exodus. Let us go against Rome. And so Pilate, being a wise governor, sought to come, come I would say he's a wise governor, but trying to be wise, um, try to find a way in which to appease the people, to keep the people a little bit less likely to rebel. And so that was by pardoning one of these individuals. Now here, there is this individual who has been convicted of murder during an insurrection. And the idea is that he will be offered alongside Jesus for this, uh, this amnesty. Right? This individual's name is Barnabas, we learn in verse 7. Now here, Barnabas' name is given before the official act. So the idea here is, is that individuals knew that Barnabas and Jesus, and possibly others, would be sort of on this slate. They were ones that the people could ask for. And so it's possible here that we see in verse 8, there's this crowd that came up. The idea is they're coming up from the lower parts of the city, and they're coming up to where um, Pilate's uh, his, uh, place of authority would be, and it could be then that individuals who were sympathetic to Barnabas and friendly to the idea of rebellion had been gathered and brought up for this purpose of asking for Barabbas's freedom. And so these individuals would support him and they would voice their opinion. So after demanding that Pilate perform his custom, he asked them about Jesus in verse 9. He says, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? Now here, when we look at at Pilate um, simplistically in the eyes of the Gospels, Pilate comes out like this good guy. Pilate was not a good man. Uh, He was a terrible man. Uh, According to both Pliny and Josephus, uh, they described him as a, a terrible racist. He hated the Semitics. He hated the Jews. He saw them nothing but as a rebellious people. So when we see him wanting to free Jesus, right, it's not that he is wanting to free Jesus because he's this righteous guy who recognizes that Jesus hasn't done anything wrong. He wants to do this because he recognizes that the chief priests and the elders have brought Jesus not because he's guilty of anything, but because they don't like him. And like, and so like, what can you do to your enemy, right? Well, you can here forgive or give amnesty to this individual because you know that's going to make the religious leader, leaders of the Jews angry. And so his, his, his purpose here is simply to infuriate them. He recognizes that Jesus was not a political agitator, and so he thought that they would, he could get the people to choose him and to over or to undermine the religious leaders. Pilate should have known, though, 
that whoever he suggested would be the one that the people would not pick. If someone you dislike says, let's go to this restaurant, you're going to say, we'll go to any restaurant but that one, right? Because you don't like that person, okay? And we don't want to have that spirit, that attitude, right? We see that too much in the political discourse of our country. If the Republicans have a good idea, all the Democrats hate it because that's what they have to do. If the Democrats have a good idea, all the Republicans hate it because that's what they have to do, right? We don't want to be like that. But that's sort of what we see here. Here, Pilate is despised by the people because Pilate represents Roman occupation. It represents that Roman authority that they don't believe should be there. And so here, when he says, hey, I got this Jesus fellow who you call the king of the Jews, would you like to free him? The natural response would be, no, we don't want him because that's who you want us to take. So we see that another option would be selected. Now, in verse 10, we see that uh, he thought that the people would side with him because the religious elites simply wanted to prosecute Jesus out of envy. In verse 11, a reference to the crowd again, um, here is stirred up to ask for Barabbas. And so they likely came up for this intention and they he just got stirred. Remind who we're asking for. Remind who we're asking for. Ask for Barabbas. Right? If there have been other people there, we're asking for Barabbas. In verse 12, Pilate then asked again, what should be done to Jesus, the king of the Jews? Apparently because he wants to give them, wants to give him some sense of, of lighter sentence. But the crowd, in verse 13, not only demands his death, but here demands his crucifixion. Getting the death penalty is severe enough, but to get crucifixion is just going above and beyond. And one of the most painful forms of death possible. And Pilate expresses again his confusion in verse 14. He says, why? What evil has he done? But what do the people respond with? They respond with, crucify him. Right? And here we just see the, the, the evil that resides in the hearts of those from rebellion against God. Throughout our history, we have seen that when those who rebelled against God, evil resides so easily in the heart. But when we think about the, the atrocities of um, what the Nazis and the Germans did to Jews, right? And you think, how is that possible? How could that, how could that take place? But when the godless, uh, in the eyes of the godless, there was nothing wrong with that. And we now live in a culture of, of slaughter. Um, I mean, I had no idea, uh, you know, as, as long as I can remember, uh, shortly after becoming a Christian, my view of the world started to change. And uh, in almost all of my presidential elections, I've been a one-issue voter. Whoever would, would seek to overthrow abortion was my sort of who I was voting for. Um, I had no idea the sort of passion that the godless had for killing infants in the womb, right? And we ask, how is this possible? How is this possible? And that is because of the depravity of the human nature apart from the grace of God. And that's what we see here with these Jews crying, crucify him, crucify him. And so that's exactly what happens. In verse 15, Pilate bends to the pressure of the people by releasing Barabbas and sentencing Jesus to crucifixion. The intent again of Barabbas's, or the, the sense of the, the purpose of the Passover amnesty was to satisfy the people so that they would be less likely to rebel. And what he's done is he's putting, putting himself in a situation that the people are going to rebel. Uh, when the Jews would often confront religious leaders, uh, they would often do it to where they would have so many people uh, in the presence of the crowd that the government would sort of have to back down, right? Uh, I think maybe uh, in a cultural context for us, we can think back to um, the riots of 2020, right? When the police forces were so overwhelmed in some of these cities that they literally just had to back down and let the people burn the streets 
This is sort of what Rome, what the Jews did when they confronted Rome. There would be so many Jews there that if the Roman governor didn't do what they wanted, the, the danger is so immense. And so here Pilate backs down. Now the irony in all of this is that why did the Jews find Jesus guilty of being a Messiah? Why do they call that blasphemy? Well, what's interesting here, the irony is, is that the reason they do this is because Jesus doesn't fit their understanding of what a Messiah is meant to be. Jesus wasn't claiming to be a Messiah who was going to overthrow Rome and be a political threat. So they accused him of blasphemy. But when they take him to Pilate, what do they do? They accuse him because they're, and they're lying about him, saying, well, he claims to be a political threat. And so here is this irony in which now Pilate is, is forced to do that which he did not want to do. And so Pilate's weakness is demonstrated by handing Jesus over to be scorched or whipped. Uh, this was not uh, a simple um, punitive exercise. Uh, like we see in other places in Scripture, uh, these whips would have had either pieces of metal or bone attached to the end of them, so that when one is whipped, it would literally grab on and rip flesh off. Uh, sometimes the, the prisoner would be tied to a, bowl, a pole, other times he would just be forced to, to be on his hands and knees or lay on the ground. Uh, in some of the historical texts, we know that when that would happen, at times bone would become visible, uh, and that sometimes even the internal organs would be able to become visible. This was often done before someone's crucified uh, because it would speed up the rate of death in crucifixion. Uh, it would weaken someone to such an extent uh, that they would not be able to, uh, to lift themselves up while on the cross. And so here, Jesus receives this sort of treatment. So though reluctant here, Pilate turns Jesus over to be crucified, one of the deaths of for the most vile of criminals. Right? This was not the, the regular means of killing a prisoner. Right? This was used by Rome as an example. Don't act like this, or this is what's going to happen. And here, Jesus, as the innocent one, does this. Now, beyond just sort of sort of the, the historical ramifications of all of this, in verse 15, I think we see something else as well. So in verse 15, it says, So Pilate wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having Jesus and having scored, scourged Jesus, he delivered him over to be crucified. I think in that one verse, we see the gospel in microcosm. We see the tiniest picture of the gospel. And what I think we see here is what is sometimes referred to as the great exchange. Great exchange. In this, we see Jesus as the innocent who is exchanged for a truly vile sinner in Barabbas. Jesus, who deserved no punishment, being substituted and taking the place of the one who truly did deserve this punishment. So in just this one verse, we see a picture of the gospel. So in conclusion, what are, what are some points of application here? First, we see that Jesus' suffering is an example to us. We must be those who, in submission to the Father, are willing to submit to the suffering that is associated with the gospel. And what that means is that so often, our suffering will not be fair. As Paul tells us, he says, you know, it is one thing to be treated wrongly because of the sake of the gospel, it's different to be treated wrongly or treated unjustly when you actually deserve it, right? To receive punishment when you actually deserve it. And so we must be willing to suffer to whatever extent that means for us in our context and our lives. For us here, it might be simply humiliation or ridicule, whereas in other parts of the globe, it means death. And there are times in which the best defense we give is simply to keep our mouths shut. We don't have to defend ourselves. And it is the example of the martyr in the midst of that persecution that stands forth as its greatest testimony. We also see here in, in, in Pilate a negative example. Jesus provides a positive example. Pilate provides for us a negative example. 
He shows us what is the consequence, what is the result when we honor man over God, or when we fear man more than we fear God. Pilate here, as the, the prefect, as the governor, could have said, I give amnesty to this individual, and he could have done it of his own accord because that is his full right under the judicial system of Rome. But instead, he backs down in the fear of man. We cannot be those who will simply turn and change our opinions and our decisions and our convictions just because the masses required of us. Christ's people must hold firm to the commandment, hold firm to the gospel, even when all of our society around us tells us that we are the ones who are wrong. We should never follow in the example of Pilate here. And lastly, I want us to make sure that we understand the weight of this, this exchange that takes place in verse 15. It, it's easy for us to say, I look to Jesus as my example. Right? And it can be easy for us to say, I want to look at Pilate as not my example. But when we look at Barabbas, we should see ourselves. In Barabbas, we see the vileness of sin and the one who should have been condemned. We are the, one, the ones who are guilty. And Christ took the wrath that was meant for us. Christ is the one who stands in the gap. He is the great exchange, the great substitute. So here, when we come to this, we mourn all these terrible things that are happening to our Savior, and yet we realize that we were the one who placed him there. If you were in Christ, and your sins have been forgiven, it was your sin that nailed him to that cross my sin too. And so we come to this text and we say, God, thank you so much for your grace and your kindness that the one who was always perfect, always innocent, took my place. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the goodness of your grace. We thank you for Christ. And Father, we come to this historically true document and we see what Christ endured being tried first throughout the, the, the dark hours of the night by the Jews, found guilty of blasphemy of which he had never committed. And now, as we saw in today's text, handed over to a Gentile to the hands of sinners that the the, the idea that the wicked, that the retrograde, that those who are opposed to God would be one responsible for judging God in Christ. And we see him try before Pilate and the, the accusations of the, of the Jews against him, which were always fabrications, always lies. And yet Jesus said not a word. He gave no defense for himself. Because ultimately, this was all about getting him to that cross. And so God, we come to this text as a historical document and we see that. But Father, we pray that you, by your grace, would take this beyond just a historical document. That you would take it in our hearts and in our lives to be your word and that we would receive it and that we would see in it our sin and our need for judgment, our need for crucifixion, our need to receive the wrath of God against sin, and yet Christ exchanged himself for us. He died and suffered your wrath that we would not have to. And so Father, let us not be like Pilate. Let us not succumb to the pressures and the, the terrors of this world, but instead, let us stand firm. Let Christ be our example. He who gave his testimony before Pilate, let us do the same. Let us not waver. Let us not betray our Christ. 
but let us hold faithful to the commandment. Oh God, we thank you for the goodness of your kindness. We thank you for the love that is demonstrated in Christ. And it's in his great name we pray. Amen. Amen.